So I don't know if you guys uh, have, if you're signed up for Joe's Substack, but if you haven't, you need to do that. He, uh, he writes great articles there and sends them right to, you or, uh, to your email uh, on transhumanism. I think uh, as we get into the topic of transhumanism, which you're going to be discussing tomorrow, I think uh, oftentimes, I know I hear it, just let's start out just definition. What is transhumanism? Well, there are a lot of different definitions. I um, try to spice it up because I'm asked that question a lot. I, but I think the central theme of transhumanism is the belief that technology itself is salvational, that human salvation lies ultimately in our creations. And although I myself don't take um, what you would call an orthodox religious view on this, I think the spiritual elements that you see in transhumanism basically translate into humanity creating for ourselves heaven on earth, humanity creating supernatural entities via artificial intelligence and other means, and then once those entities have surpassed humanity, in the predictions of many transhumanists, and certainly in the post-human realm, the idea is that humanity will ultimately have to submit or fuse with this sort of digital deity, and that could happen via a number of vehicles. All of them are proposed, and many of those vehicles are in active development. So anything from virtual reality uh, to uh, an implanted brain-computer interface uh, to other more standard means. So in short, transhumanism is a religious point of view that holds technology up as the highest power. You know, talk about that, because that, that might seem very uh, counterintuitive to people in thinking that, for the most part, um, talk about those that are on the, the leading edge, kind of the technical, technological edge of these people aren't necessarily going to church every Sunday. And so when we think about religion, oftentimes we can think about that. Talk about really the, that really interesting dynamic or almost oxymoron in the sense of secular people seeking eternity in a religious sense. Well, I mean, from a scientific point of view, uh, humanity is at the pinnacle of creation. Outside of the existence of extraterrestrials, a scientist would say that human intelligence is the greatest intelligence on the planet. Uh, transhumanists see that intelligence as profoundly flawed, and they see artificial intelligence in particular as this sort of crystalline form that could surpass human intelligence overcome our flaws, and ultimately be more powerful. So an, a, a key example is Elon Musk. Uh, I'm sure everyone knows that Elon Musk is now the, the coolest man on earth, according to every conservative uh, outside of a very small few holdouts, my, myself included. Rather but cautious, um, for sure. <laughs> Elon Musk, uh, I think, is probably the most famous transhumanist on the planet, even if he, I don't know that he's ever used the term but he's certainly immersed in transhumanist philosophy. Uh, Nick Bostrom is probably the most uh, prominent example, the author of the book Superintelligence, whom uh, Musk references often, but many others. So when you look at the Neuralink device, the intent, the stated intent behind the Neuralink device is to link human biological intelligence with artificial intelligence. Of course, artificial intelligence uh, is being developed by Tesla. They, uh, Musk has hinted a number of times openly that artificial general intelligence, meaning something that is roughly equivalent to human intelligence in its breadth and its depth, but obviously far faster, far more accurate. And so the Neuralink device, which is clearly far behind the timeline he had foreseen back in 2016 for various reasons, the Neuralink device, which is a small quarter-sized uh, implant where you would have a, a quarter-sized hole pulled out of the skull, the implant put in with about 1,024 small hair-thin wires going into the brain, and that then would allow a person, first quadriplegics, but he hopes eventually consumers, to basically commune with this digital deity, with an advanced artificial intelligence. And his purpose, he says, is to spare humanity from the imminent dangers that would ultimately be posed by a, a, an advanced artificial intelligence. It would allow us to keep up 
And it would allow us again to fuse with it, to merge man with machine, a human AI symbiosis. And that's th that symbiosis between man and machine, um, first articulated by a DARPA researcher back in the 60s, uh, that is really at the core of transhumanism, the humanity as a transitional entity going towards something else, and technology being the means for humanity to transcend our earthly flaws and weaknesses and hopefully become in some sense to the extent that technology is the highest power some sense divine in that view um in, in the sense of to, as you mentioned take take the religious side out of it in the sense of those that might have uh, religious objections just strictly from a humanist perspective you you see um all these things like Neuralink, and of course when elon's presenting it He's presenting it as a way that this is great, this is awesome. And in some ways, this would be awesome for people that may can't see or can't hear to have that opportunity. So with all these promises that are made of the benefits, uh, what are, just from a completely human perspective, what are the risks? Why aren't we embracing this? Why not? What's, what, what, are we, what are we here to fear? You know, I think a lot of people are embracing it. Uh, far more than, it surprises me daily how many people are completely comfortable with the notion, if not of an implanted brain-computer interface, Certainly a non-invasive brain-computer brain interface, of which many exist, right? Uh, and they're all obviously in development. But a non-invasive brain-computer interface, in theory, could accomplish the same thing. It would simply read the blood flow and the electromagnetic activity of the brain and translate that into something that could be used for command and control with a computer system. So, and then, of course, the input would be sensory as it is now. So... To the question of why reject it from a purely naturalist point of view, of which there are many people who are any, anywhere from agnostic to atheist who argue against this, according to the theory of evolution, human beings have evolved over the course of, you could say, 50 million years, if you look at the primates, or it would be something in the neighborhood of 6 million years, if it looked at more human-like primates, and then with human beings uh, themselves, ourselves, about a quarter million years of biological evolution to lead to this point. So when they say that technology is just simply an extension of evolution, it's just another phase in evolution in which humanity will step up, the theory of evolution doesn't hold that these entities made these drastic leaps. What we're talking about is basically the end of what evolution created in the beginning of what technological evolution would create. And all of the disruptions to our instincts, all of the disruptions to our neurological faculties, and ultimately all of the, the disruption to the social order, which we already see now, uh, would, whether or not it ended up beneficially or, or you know, a, a horrendous disaster, uh, what you're talking about basically is the end of us, the end of Homo sapiens, and the beginning of what Elon Musk's uh, the mother of Elon Musk's children calls homo techno. And I think that from a purely naturalist, physiological point of view, that hubris should be checked at every turn. Because what we are is, is developed and, and integrated into the planet in a natural, in a natural fashion. And what technology has done, particularly over the last 150 years, is to completely detach human beings from that natural order. And it has been devastating on the broader planetary ecosystem. And while Elon Musk obviously positions himself to be one who is actively promoting sustainability, I think that in the end, it's inevitable that an advanced technological society, especially of 8, 10, 12 million people plus would be exponentially devastating on the planet, on the ecosystem. So again, uh, I, I myself am not a pure naturalist, but that's the argument. No, fair enough. When we think about um, just our culture as it relates to, Tim mentioned it, just the, the Hollywood culture, the movie culture, uh, in the sense of how young people are being conditioned, um, how realistic is it to stop the wave of coming? of transhumanism. What do well, we do? I mean, if, if that's the goal, how realistic? So uh, um, imagine that all of the goals of transhumanism are uh, either possible or even inevitable. 
I think that the momentum, the cultural momentum from Silicon Valley to academia, uh, to the World Economic Forum, to uh, the Chinese Communist Party, and various other entities around the world, the momentum towards these goals, the momentum towards that man-machine symbiosis is so powerful. I'm not sure that there is a way to stop it outside of you know, a, a, a freak solar flare or EMPs detonated with hydrogen bombs in the atmosphere, which uh, I, I don't recommend that as a solution, by the way. It's sending us back to the Stone Age, yeah. So, um, and I don't think anyone really wants to go back to the Stone Age. So uh, how do you stop it? I don't know that any normal individual could, and I don't know that if Elon Musk decided to recant tomorrow, that he could stop it. Because that momentum is so powerful with such a deep history and so much money and, and so much reputation invested. So for me, I think that the wisest thing going forward is to simply identify this broad paradigm shift in the world, decide where you stand in relation to it. And I think that every human being on earth that has the cognitive capacity to recognize this danger, it's up to them to draw the line as to where it's at. I would take it back to a watch and a landline myself and a big stack of books, but that's very particular, and I think every person has their own particular uh, fears and affinities. But uh, as, as I wrote recently, it is definitely a slippery slope from a smartphone to virtual reality to a brain-computer interface. Yeah, you, in, your, in your latest uh, post, you talked about a cyborg theocracy and that slippery slope. Kind of just give us a, a quick rundown of that. Well, cyborg theocracy isn't my term. Um, it comes from, uh, we'll just call him a mad Albanian who has never really defined the term, and he never plans to, I don't think. And honestly, I don't think he has to. He simply points to those elements in the culture that he sees as embodying the brain-machine interface from what ultimately is a theological point of view. And so a cyborg theocracy is a technocratic civilization in which whoever wields the most powerful technologies will determine history. And so as we are ruled by these technologies, including the microphones in front of our faces and the speakers echoing out as human minds are shaped by these technologies, that theocracy is given realization. And so the slippery slope to, th to, to a cyborg theocracy to me is simply the degree to which individuals in a society orient themselves towards technology and those who wield technology as being something either sacred or at the very least something that one must submit to and that one submits one's children to. And I think that the way out of that begins with the, the traditional orientation towards the divine, the, the traditional orientation towards that which transcends this physical realm. And the decisions made and the lines drawn, in as much as they are based on that orientation towards some sort of supernatural, or at the very least, uh, non-human in origin divinity, to the extent human beings are oriented towards that, I don't know that a brain-computer interface, I don't know that a brain chip would compromise that person's soul. Because I, I think that technology is neutral to the extent that it is part of the physical realm and it is separate from the deepest human self and it's separate from the, the highest divine form. And so however far we're dragged along in that process, however crazy and science fiction-ish and, and uh, horrific and dystopian it may be, I think that that path to the divine always exists, and so I, I don't think that there are any absolutes there. Yeah. Well, Joe, appreciate it. We are, you don't want to miss his talk tomorrow, and uh, appreciate you being here. Thank you very much, sir. Folks, the Birthright Conference was an extraordinary event. We filmed over six hours of content including presentations from myself, Joe Allen, Gary Haven, and Mancow Muller, covering a variety of topics, such as 
theological perspectives on angels and how they relate to extraterrestrials, transhumanism and the post-human paradigm, UFOs and alien abduction, and the dehumanization and depopulation agenda of the globalist elite. The conference is now available for purchase in DVD, digital download, and long-term rental formats. Go to birthrightconference.com to secure your copy today.